had with the weather and not having power and having snowstorms in October, this is a lot better place to be. And I'd like to introduce our speaker for this morning, Thomas Jones, will present an interactive and inspiring, it says inspiring, talk, <laughs> how to get what you really need in a love relationship. Uh, this is based on his book called Love Games. He breaks through the many fantasies, expectations, and illusions of relationship in order to reveal the true dynamics of coupling. Uh, he's been in practice for 30 years, motivating his clients to be their best. I'd like to introduce Thomas M. Jones. <laughs> Thanks very much. The true dynamics of coupling. <laughs> Who wrote that? Don't. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we had a, um, a focus group yesterday, and we were talking about why, why write this book, why, why talk about this. And I've been in practice for 35 years, 34 years, and um, listening to people talk about relationship, about love, about the dynamics of relationship, and watching as the kind of hopes and expectations of relationship really crush people. You know, we have such high expectations about this thing we do, this loving, and are invariably brought down to earth in sometimes not so pleasant ways. So I think it can be very painful and very disappointing. But, you know, my real message is that relationship can be absolutely magical but based on reality, not based on the fantasy, not based on the expectations, not based on the pain that people go through. And I think it's easy to see that we have a society that cultivates that. You know, we were talking earlier about six-year-old girls that start fantasizing, start, you know, trying on the princess outfit and thinking about the prince charming and so forth and so on. And how can you not have expectations of relationship when that's what you're brought up with. And we talked about boys too. Boys are off, who knows what they're doing, right? But they're, they're playing the other half of that fantasy. They're playing the hero. You know, unwittingly, they're playing the other side of that fantasy. They're trying to be Prince Charming. They're trying to be the hero. So it's interesting that that fantasy starts so early and it's so in our culture that it's hard to escape. You know, even if you tried to create a relationship out of the box, you'd be fighting so much culture, so much expectation. So it's a tough thing to break through, you know. And the obvious is that it's fun to expect it to be that way. You know, it's fun to imagine that you have Prince Charming and all of your neuropeptides and chemicals go right along with it. You know, when you first fall in love, it feels like this is it. You know, I have found true love. I, despite whatever the statistics are out there, I've found someone that I can believe in and something that I can build on. And again, that's the first stage of relationship. And of course, it goes on. I know you guys have never experienced the discipline of a relationship, but... <laughs> It happens. <laughs> Somehow we're brought down to a different reality, a grittier reality where, oh, this is what partnership is and this is what it isn't. And I think when you're brought up with those expectations, you can't help but be disappointed that reality is what it is. But we're going to do some exercises today. We're going to play a little bit and I'm going to show you how how much power you actually have in a relationship. Um, I do want to get to that trust issue. Somebody asked me about trust, that how do you trust in a relationship, or how do you reclaim trust after that trust was broken? But we're going to touch on that later, because I think that's a powerful question. You know, you feel like you're in danger if you're trusting, right? That feels dangerous. And we're always looking for a safe place to be. But sometimes the safest place to be doesn't feel so safe. But we'll talk about that, because I, I really want to touch on that. But I want to 
give you guys an experience. I want to, I want to sing. No, I want to, <laughs> every time I'm in front of a microphone, I want to sing. Um, we're going to do, an, we're going to do a visualization. I'm going to actually have you close your eyes. I'm going to take you somewhere, okay? A place inside of you that you'll find very familiar. And we're going to explore what goes on in that inner space because I want to show you that the experiences that you have in relationship are the experiences you're creating, you're bringing into it. And I'm not saying you don't have assistance creating those things. You do. Okay? You've got plenty of cooperation. But the reality is you can bring your power and your experience into a relationship in a way that you have a lot of, here's my favorite word, control. You have a lot of control over the experience that you have in a relationship. And I think that's important because everybody is seeking safety in a relationship. You know, we want to know that we're safe. We want to know that this is going to work, that we're on an intelligent path. But if you knew the resources that you have inside, if you knew that you could put aside those outer expectations and create from within, you'd feel a lot safer in a relationship. So you guys, do you know what a visualization is? You're looking skeptical. Do you know what a... Where you visualize? Yeah. Okay. So here's what I'm going to have you do. Here's what I'm going to have you do. I'm going to have you close your eyes, so I'd like you to do that now. I'd like you to close your eyes. And we're going to go back in time. I want you to think back on the last time you were, or maybe the best time, that you were truly happy, that you truly experienced happiness, right? So if that means going back in time and letting your mind drift and kind of looking at different times that you were happy and really finding a place or an event, or a time, when you were really happy. And as you arrive there, I want you to allow yourself to take in the scenery there, to see it, to sense it, to experience it, and really allow yourself to feel what your body feels like in that, in that happiness, in that situation. Allow yourself to feel the feelings and emotions that you've felt in that experience. And really let go of everything else but that experience, that joy, that happiness. Maybe it was a playful time or an easy time. Reimagine the season, the time of year, the experiences that you had, and allow yourself to feel what that feels like emotionally. Allow yourself to feel it in your body, to feel it in your emotions, and really let yourself enjoy that experience. And as you're allowing yourself to really let that come up, you're letting go of this moment and immersing yourself in those, really luxuriating in that happiness. Feel what it feels like physically. Feel what it feels like emotionally. Really allow yourself to experience that happiness. Picture the people involved, the experience, the weather, the sights, the sounds. Really fill your senses with that happiness. And I want you to just rest there. Allow yourself to dwell there. And really let that experience take you over. And as you luxuriate in that experience, let everything else go. Let everything else drift. Let everything else fade. But that joy, that playfulness, that happiness. And as you dwell in that happiness, I want you to sense it building and growing inside of you. Really feel the strength of it. Feel the resilience of it. Feel the ease of it and the clarity. 
And again, allow yourself to play, to luxuriate, to enjoy it, to experience it. And just stay in that for a moment. Now I want you to imagine that you're collecting all of that happiness, that you're taking it in, that you're filling up on it, that you're filling from head to toe. In fact, that it's this white light that's filling you up, just empowering and enlivening you. Fill up with it completely. And as you start to make your way back from that past, I want you to bring that happiness with you. I want you to imagine that it's filled you up like gas filling up a gas tank and you're full now with that happiness and you're coming back to this moment, coming back to this time. And that in your mind's eye, I want you to imagine that you're filling this time with that joy, with that happiness, with that power. And really see yourself infusing this moment with that happiness, that joy, and that power. Allow yourself to enjoy it, and to even experience everything that's going on in your life right now through that filter. And as you let it come up and through your life, I want you to now open your eyes and come back to me. Did you have an experience? How'd that feel? Well, I'm happy anyway. <laughs> Did you like that? So I want to show you that you've just changed your experience. You've just changed your mood, your temperament, your point of view, your reality. That you're in charge of the wheels and dials that go on in your emotions. Now this is a different filter to look through. Happiness is a very different filter than frustration or fear or anger or worry or doubt. Does it feel a little more resourceful, a little more resilient? It kind of fills you up. So I want you to imagine that you could fill up like that at your choosing, anytime you choose, and that you could infuse that energy, that power, into any area, any situation that you want. Okay? You can take that happiness like a commodity and infuse it into your work, into your relationship, into your life. Does that make sense? Do you follow that so far? So we're going to do part two of this, which is maybe harder, maybe easier. I don't know. You ready for the second half of this visualization? Did you like that part? You like that part. <laughs> I can see that. There's a lot of happiness here. You should have seen yourselves, by the way. You were beaming. You were like, there was bliss going on. So once more, I want you to close your eyes. And this time I want you to go back to the time when you first fell in love. Okay? I want you to think back and go back to... and. Could be a five-year, you know, crush when you were five years old. It could be a college. It could be any kind of relationship. But go back to the time when you fell in love. Now let's see if you can find that inside of you. So again, you're going to let the present go, and you're going to allow your mind to go back to that time, and allow yourself to fill up with the sights and the sounds and the feelings and the emotions and the experience of falling in love. That sense of being free and uplifted. That sense of possibility. You know, the feeling of love is anything is possible. We feel like we're walking on water, anything is possible. So allow yourself to imagine those feelings and those emotions. And again, allow yourself to surrender to that feeling in that moment. Leave all these other moments behind and go to that first moment, 
that moment of falling in love, of surrendering to that love, of being overwhelmed by it and enjoying it at the same time. And really let yourself enjoy that. Fill up with it. Allow yourself to be excited about it. Allow yourself to play with it. And feel the freedom and the possibility that that is. Really allow yourself to surrender. And I want you to experience that physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Allow yourself to be enlivened and excited by that energy. And as you fill up with that energy, I want you to take that energy in and bring it with you. And I want you to move forward in time through your love history and see if you can bring that energy into each chapter, each segment of your life, each love, each love affair, each moment, and see if you can use all of that energy to inform and enliven all of the parts of your love life. Really allow yourself to enjoy it and to experience it. And let's see if you can hold on to the goodwill of that loving feeling. and bring it all the way to the present moment. And I want you to arrive here in this present moment filled with that sense of loving and being in love, with that power that that gives you. When you feel like you've arrived there, you can open your eyes. So again, what this is up to, you can come back now. Some people are having too much fun over there. <laughs> you can. So these are, the, these are the states of mind that we can create. That you're in charge of how you feel. You're in charge of what goes on for you. Okay? You're in charge of what the experience is for you and what you see and what you go through. So we often assign how we feel to a situation or to a relationship. Like so-and-so is making me unhappy or I'm, I'm mad at this or I'm frustrated at that or he's not giving me this or this one's not doing that. And we can feel devastated, but we have so much internal resource that, you know, in a way, it's time to stop giving your power to your partner. Stop giving your power to this this kind of institution of love. Stop giving your power away to your expectations of what it should be. And really make determinations. You know, I think the through line of this is that you can change any situation you're in into what you want it to be, but it has to be internally. It has to be, you don't believe me, eh? <laughs> well, we're going to challenge this idea. <laughs> You know, I've seen, I've, I've worked with couples for, for years and years. And, you know, one of the things I say is that nine-tenths of what goes wrong in a relationship are the mechanics or the dynamics, the misunderstandings, the miscommunication and the, and the missed connections between people. You know, you see a couple sitting in front of you and they both feel hard done by. They both feel misunderstood. And what's fascinating is that if you get to this place in them, if you get to that original loving place and start from there. That's really what everybody wants. That's what they're trying to reclaim. People just don't know how to do it. They fight, they argue, they're frustrated, they have expectations, they have disappointments, and they throw their emotions at it as though if I throw enough into this, I'm going to somehow change this as an effort of will. But the reality is, you can change it, but it has to be from a place where you remember who you are as a loving being, that you show up with that, and that you try to call that forth from a partner. 
You know, somebody asked a question about trust earlier. Like, why should I trust? <laughs> and she had reason to ask because she's been hurt. And your trust gets pretty abused when you get hurt. You know, you feel disappointed and betrayed and the whole gamut. And I'm not saying that's easy, it's certainly not. But I said to her, you know, if you ask me, how do you trust your partner? I said, don't. <laughs> Why should you trust them? You gotta trust you. And that's, that's the glib answer, right? But the whole answer is that you gotta choose trust because that's where you wanna live. You gotta choose to trust your partner because that's gonna empower, that's gonna change your experience. That's gonna allow you a space that you can show up that isn't painful and uncomfortable. And I was explaining to her that, you know, by empowering somebody with trust, that doesn't make you blind. That doesn't make you stupid. That doesn't mean you're not going to see what goes on or what doesn't. Obviously, if somebody is too weak not to betray you, you've got to move on. That's not a situation you can be in. But that doesn't mean that you have to suffer in a relationship and live in that mistrust. What's funny to me is that mistrust makes you blind because you're always suspicious, you're always afraid, and you interpret everything according to that fear, so you never know what's true and what's not. But if you start with trust, you're not going to be blind. You'll see them coming a mile away, and you'll be in the experience that you want to be. In addition, that mistrust calls forth mistrustful behavior. You know how when you expect somebody to do something, pretty soon they will? Right? And then somehow you're kicking yourself like, I was a part of this. So, I think for the sake of your experience and for the sake of the experience of the relationship, you have to choose trust. And that's the smarter choice. That's the clearer choice. And that's the choice that lets you see what's happening and what's going to happen. So, I want you guys to think about questions that you have about relationship, problems that you have, or issues that you want to challenge, you want to talk about. Because I want to do a little Q&A and start, start playing with these thoughts. I thought that trust question was great, though. So, what do we have here? What are, what are the issues, what are the questions that you have, what are the challenges that you have? Mm -hmm. Well, I think trust comes, first of all, yes. I'll give you the short answer. That you're not going to blindly trust. And I don't think blindness is a useful quality in any relationship. I think it always has to be informed. You know, you're always in a position where you should be attending to that relationship. You know, you should be looking, you should be wondering, what are the dynamics here? What's going on here? What are we doing? How are we communicating? What are we, what are we playing with here? You know, one of the things I said is people pay more attention to their house plants than they do their relationship, right? At least you water them every day. If you gave some attention to your relationship, if you made an investment in it, you would trust more. Is it a calculated or informed trust? You bet. Because we're not fools, we don't want to be hurt, we want to see what will be, but I think you have to see with open hands. You know, trying to control a relationship or control somebody else's behavior is painful for two reasons. One, the jailer is in jail. If you're trying to control, you're being controlled. And that's not a good experience to be having. So even if you manage to control them, you're still locked into that behavior. So I think it's a powerful thing to do to, yeah, empower that trust and make it an awareness. But attend, communicate. You know, we often assume what's going on with somebody else without even knowing it. We react automatically, we build habitual reactions so that conversation between two people that know each other can be so rote you know, after five years, the most common way that couples address each other is, what? 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 Right? It's not like, oh, darling, I love you. <laughs> it's like, what do you want? What? 
So I think you've got a living, breathing thing called a relationship that requires care and nurturing and attention and communication. And again, I'm not talking about, you know, spending two hours a day looking in each other's eyes and talking to each other. I couldn't stand that. Um, talking about checking in, maybe for five minutes a day, you know, sitting across from somebody and actually communicating and, and connecting with them, right? Really, as much as you give to a houseplant, that'll do. That's a lot of attention. And I think it'll transform things. But yes, an informed and awareness, right? Be aware of what you're in. Question, issue? I'll make you talk. <laughs> yeah. You've been in a very long relationship, and you no longer have that relationship. The widow the divorced. And you're starting to make new relationships with new men. Mm. That's where the trust issues become very apparent. Because you don't know what they're telling you is the truth, or what they want you to hear, or you hear what you want. That's true, because you know the beginning of a relationship is a sales pitch. It is definitely. Yeah. And the first date is it's like, I'm great. <laughs> so the first, the first date is an interview. You get through the first day, and then there's another day. So I, I found some interesting things, and I, can I just read them? Sure. Um, the difference, you have to know these things. I think, the quarter, I think in order to know where the relationship is going, what you have. The difference between a man who flatters you or a man who compliments you. Hmm. One I want you to address. Okay. The second is a man who spends money on you or a man who invests in you. Okay. So, a man who I'd want both of those, but go on. <laughs> I forgot another next word. A man who views a man who views you as property or a man who treats you properly. Wow. Okay. There's a good distinction. Uh, a man who lusts after you or a man who loves you. How about both for those two? I like that. A man who believes that he's God's gift to women, or a man who remembers that women is God's gift to men. Those are the things I'd like to address. That's great. <laughs> Where is this guy? Let's bring him in here. We'll vet him for you. Well, whatever you like to address. Well, I like the flattery versus, what was it, flattery versus what? Compliment? Okay, fair enough. Because it sounds like the one, the flattery, is a manipulation, mm. right? And you can feel it. You can feel it a mile away. It's like a used car salesman, kind of. But not when you're vulnerable. Oh, then it feels real? Then it feels real. I see. That means you want to hear that. Okay. So then you're trying to decide, how, do I, how am I accurate in my needs based on who I'm with? It is. It's totally a trust issue. But I think, you know, high risk, high reward. If, if you're going to play this game, it's going to be a risk. You're going to have to risk some things. And I think at some point you have to trust your intelligence. Look, if somebody's trying to con you, you're going to know that pretty quick. You know, we're pretty savvy down the line. No, she's not going to know it. <laughs> well, you will, though. <laughs> If you're asking these questions, you're going to know the difference, right? But I think the more you communicate, look, the, you know, the flowers and candy is nice, the compliments are nice, all of it's nice, but it, it's the prelude to a relationship. It's not even a relationship, okay? You know, it's this fun dance we do before we decide to get down to brass tacks. Are you the partner that I can work with? Are you the person that I can communicate with, right? And I think the sooner you get to real communication, the, the more you're going to see, is this genuine? Is this authentic? Is this something I can be myself in, right? So yeah, the flattery, I would expect all that. The lust, I would demand that. But the... <laughs> I demand it. Yeah, so do you. Um, but, you know, somebody who's sincere, somebody, somebody who speaks from the heart, somebody who speaks to your heart, somebody that is not manipulating you or positioning you because they want something, but somebody who genuinely likes this 
communication, this partnership, right? This energy. I think that's what you got to go by. That's, that's the litmus test. The other stuff, half of it falls away anyway, you know? But if you build a communication, that's what you've got, right? What was that Dalai Lama quote? That pick somebody that you can talk to because at the end of the day, that's all you have left, right? Now that's a little cynical, and he is a monk. But it's true that start with that. You know, when you can look at somebody eye to eye and know that you're communicating, then you've got something, right? And then begins the real exploration. The real exploration, do we have connection? You know, are we on the same page mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually? You know, do we have like values and like dreams, right? Because I think you really start building a relationship when you start thinking and imagining this future that you can have together. Right? I think that's part of the fun and part of the glue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I find with relationships, it's like a, like a fine line between the two people, like a spider web. Just when you think it's mutual, and you feel it, and you know all these things, whatever, and you, you give, but you never show, and then the person gives back, and you feel like, this is it, this is it. And then somebody falls away, and it feels like it, the whole thing was an illusion because it really was a connection there. But then, how do you know? How do you 100% know? You never know. You have to trust that person that it was mutual. You never know, but I can tell you this about pulling away, right? That relationship is like an orbit. Sometimes you're closer, sometimes you're further away, but that doesn't mean you're out of orbit, right? Depending on the things that you go through in a relationship, there are times when you're going to pull back and deal with your life. There are times when you're going to attend to that. Right? There's a chapter on my book about the stages of relationship. You know, the first stage is that identification where you're right there with each other. You know, you're giving, you're sharing, you're loving. It's, it's great. You know, we both love Chinese food. That's wonderful. Right? But that changes. You find out she doesn't like Chinese food. It changes and there is a separation. And most people give up relationship when they feel that initial pulling away. And I think it's a tactical error. That's the beginning of a real relationship. Because until you differentiate between you and that other person, you know, what's happening is that you pull back and you start to integrate this into your life. You start to see, okay, well, I have her here and I have my life and I have my friends and I have this. And it's a sorting process where it feels like distance, but it's actually not, it is not the indication that it's over. But a lot of people bail at that moment in time, and that's a tactical error. I would wait that out and provide for my own needs at that point in time. You know, kind of put it on hold for a second, reintegrate into your life. You know, the thing that I see that people do that makes them weak in relationship is you abandon everything that was feeding you along the way. You know, we have our circle of friends, we have our interests, we have our passions, we have the things that we involve ourselves in life, then we have this relationship. And we can often just kind of throw all that away and jump into this. And the things that were making you stronger suddenly aren't there. And so you change in that relationship. You are in a weaker position. And I think it's important to integrate everything into your life and that relationship into your life. But that momentary pullback does not mean it's over. It means it's changing. And it's supposed to change. Okay? It changes, it molts, it grows, it seems further apart, then it comes back together. And there's always the opportunity to make it deeper the next time you come together. Unless he's not calling. <laughs> then, then you got trouble. What's that? Oh, we need to take a break. Okay, we need to take a break. And what's the break for? Oh, okay, coffee, book signing, break. We'll be back in how many minutes? 15 minutes. Okay, so we're going to take a break. We'll be back. Be gritty of what goes on in relationship. 
Um, I know that you had a question. What was? Uh, the line with honesty. What's like too much honesty in a relationship? Where can you overshare or undershare? Yes, you absolutely can overshare. And by the way, I don't believe in full disclosure. Okay, I had a couple where the girl felt like oh, tell too much about yourself, about your past, about your history, about your life, about your feelings. Yeah, your thoughts, your feelings, right? Don't do any of that. No, wait. <laughs> No, I don't mean that. <laughs> it's uh, undersharing. No, but I had a couple that um, got into a relationship and it was hot and heavy and they were crazy about each other and she felt she needed to disclose her past history and relationship. Yeah, see, some people are understanding what that did. And she gave him too much information. She gave him too much information, uh, including who she'd been with and some of the experiences that she'd been through. And, you know, that's, it's an honest feeling that you want to share. You want to open your heart and soul to somebody. But I warned her ahead of time that this is, it's a complicated idea because you're going to put images into somebody's head that they're never going to be able to get out. Okay? And that's effectively what she did that she gave him images that he had a lot of goodwill because it was the beginning of a relationship, but he just couldn't digest it. And ultimately, it was, it was the obstacle in the relationship. It just wore it out, you know. He couldn't fight those pictures, those demons. And I think it's unfair to somebody to lay the burden of your history on them and say, now, deal with that, right? I think you got to know who you're dealing with first and really be judicious about what you're sharing. Just a, a follow-up to that, though. Um, do you not ever fully disclose, or as the relationship matures, do you at some point tell Well, I think, I think there are points at which you can share that. You know, there may be a point later on when the relationship is more mature where you can even laugh about those things. You can share, you can talk, you can talk about your history, but I think in the tender years, in the tender times, it's too much to bear. You know, a lot of that relationship is ego. And you're, you're challenging somebody's ego by giving them too much information. And you know, I'm not just talking about sharing about your past lovers. I'm talking about some of your thoughts, some of your feelings, some of, some of the things that you might want to express. You know, you think, this is a great idea to tell them how I feel. Right? Except, <laughs> you're smiling. <laughs> Except, you may not feel that way an hour from now, and you've just put something on him that he has to deal with. You know, I think a lot of our feelings and emotions are our responsibility. And it can really be a matter of oversharing where you're putting that on somebody else. Like, make me feel a different way. And Believe it or not, that's you giving your power away. Because your feelings are your responsibility. That's your work. And feelings are there because there's something there for you to learn. You know, whether you're hurt or you're scared or you're worried or you're doubtful, that means there's something in here that is rubbing against reality that hurts. Not something over there. And the minute you start using somebody else as a solution to your feelings, it becomes dependent, codependent, and dangerous in a way. You're literally giving your power away. You're saying, you can make me feel good or bad or safe or okay. And that's not fair to you, and it's not fair to the relationship. You know, people will shoulder that burden, like, okay, I'll make you feel good. But they can't do that, you know. And after a while, they'll be kind of managing your feelings, maybe even micromanaging them, trying to keep you in that good place. And that's really your work. Does that make sense to you? So who did that make angry? <laughs> Somebody. Question. Uh, what was it? Oh, go ahead. There was someone over there?
it's different love. Like I mean, relationships are not all the same. That's just thoughts that I'm thinking. That's true. It's different loves. It's different reasons why you meet people and why you're put in the situation, I believe. Oh, I agree. And I think, you know, here's an unromantic concept, but I, I believe it's true, that you're there to learn from whoever your partner is. And you're going to learn different things from different people. And you're going to combine in different ways that you make a unique relationship that wasn't like this, or, you know, or, or is like that. So you're right. You learn different things from different people. Then there are people that don't learn. <laughs> and they will create... Mistakes that you make that you meet people for a reason. It's not that you make a mistake. It's you meet a person, there's a reason why you're meeting them, I believe. Absolutely. I don't think there are any mistakes. I think we're with the people we're with in order to learn very particular things. But we resist that sometimes. We don't want to learn all the time. Like, I'll get rid of them and then I won't have to no, learn. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think everybody strikes us in a different way. And you're going to see things about you. You know, everybody's a mirror. We, we come across these mirrors called relationship, and we get to see ourselves in that mirror. And different people reflect you in different ways. It's not all about what you, what's good for me. Really. Right. In a relationship, it's good for two people. It has to be. It's not only about me, it's only, not only about him. You know, it's about us, us, or growing. And you're right. Yeah, and there's an us that gets created. There's an us that has a personality that interacts with the world, right? There's a character that gets created between the two of you. And it's fascinating. You know, you've seen the couples that you go to dinner with them and they're fighting the whole time. And you wanna first kill yourself and then kill them. Not sure which order. That's a personality that gets created between the two of them. That's their strange chemistry, and they're not learning something. So it comes out. But there are other couples that are so agreeable and so easy to play with and interact with, and that's the personality they create. But I think everybody you combine with, you show up in a different way. You show up as a different kind of permutation. Question? Why am I here? You're here to learn. Then there are the relationships that you repeat over and over and over. <laughs> you get caught in the same ones. And you think, why am I picking the same person? But you're not. You're picking the same lesson. You're trying to learn something. You know, there's a rhyme and reason to why you're interacting with everybody you're interacting with. And you figure out, what am I trying to learn here? then you get to either transform that relationship or move on, right? So they're not the same color. They don't look the same. <laughs> you know, we... I, I disagree with you when you say transforming. I was married, I was, and there's no way that you transform them. We're still friends, we're friends now. Oh, I'm not talking about transforming them. Transforming you. You know, sometimes they're not going to grow and change. That's their problem. I think in a way it has to be, you know, you have to be in a relationship for you. Not that you shouldn't be giving and generous and loving, but here's the person you need to be taken care of and loving, right? When you love over here, you're easy to love. But when you try to give your love, and expect love in return, that's a little more difficult. You gotta love you. Yeah? What's your definition of love? I don't know. <laughs> I'll tell you I'll tell you my I'll tell you the spiritual definition I have, right? I think love is a cooperation, an agreement between two people to connect, to move each other forward, and to call forth each other's greatness, right? 
You know when you're with somebody that, that really loves you, you feel like, I can be my best. You feel really empowered by it. I think that's what love is. Love is kind of this permission and possibility all at once that allows you to be your best and mutually allows them. When you call forth the best in each other. That's the spiritual. And emotionally, hmm. What is love? Because they say in the beginning when you're young and, you know, in your 20s and the first time, you know, getting married, you fall in love. I hate that phrase. I hate it. But yeah, I fell in some love on the way here. <laughs> It's choosing, yeah. Choosing is easy, it's staying everything. That's why they call it yeah. falling, because everybody can fall in love. It's very easy, but staying in love is what the goal is. Really. Yeah, I think falling in love, that's kind of a misnomer, because you're falling in lust, or you're falling into fantasy, or you're falling into infatuation, and it's, it's a wonderful state. I love it. I wouldn't do without it. But I think it's the beginning of possibility for a relationship. I don't think it's the relationship. And a lot of people identify that as the relationship, and when that goes, they think, oh, I fell out of love. Well, no, that's the opportunity to actually create partnership. So yeah, falling in love, uh, that's rough. You know, it, it's really a combination of neuropeptides and chemicals that you're falling in love with, right? So when they pass, as they must, then you talk about long-term commitment then you talk about building in an intelligent way. But you know, I likened building a relationship to picking a business partner. And I know that sounds a little unromantic, but you really gotta figure out, can I work with this person? You know, are we on the same page? Can we communicate? Can we negotiate? Can we create what we wanna create? Do we dream alike? Can we dream alike? And I think, again, if you think of how much you would vet a business partner. It'd be interesting to at least look at your love partner that way. At least kind of look through those eyes. Yeah? One of the top three problems that you see with your clients? The top three problems? I think certainly it's about love. I've been in practice for 35 years and Invariably, it comes down to love relationship, right? Like, how do I get it, or how do I sustain it, or how do I get out of it? But I think expectations, probably the first and most difficult problem in relationship. Because we have these expectations of our partner. And the only thing that can lead to disappointment is expectation. So we expect them to understand us. We expect them to know how we feel. We expect them to know what we want. And we think it's love if they're a good guesser. You know, We think it's love if they can, I know what you want. But that's just good salesmanship. So I think expectations is a big problem. I think people giving their power away in relationship and like I said before, abandoning your life or abandoning your support system or abandoning who you've been for a relationship, that's a huge problem. Because you weaken yourself, you denature yourself, and you're not the person who fell in love or who they fell in love with. And so that becomes a big problem. Those are only two. The women. You want to know? The women. Who gets the raw end of the deal? You guys. Okay? But you got to remember, relationship is a construct of women. Okay? I, I sit across from men, and they're like, why can't we just hang out? Right? Women have the structure, the format, the understanding that relationship has to build and grow and move forward and you know, and men are like, what? I'm just hanging out. What's up? 
So I, I think that because women, in a way, have more of an investment in it, I think they get the short end of the stick. Because, and, you know, find an enlightened man. Because that's half the work, that they understand that, you know, we're, we're all in it for the long haul. What I've seen about people is that we all want the same thing. Men want what women want. They want that long-term relationship, they want partnership, communication, connection. They just don't know how to get there. <laughs> I'm betraying my race here. But it's true, you know, I think women have been taught to deal with their feelings and emotions and expectations so much younger than men, and we've been kind of talked away from that or kind of cultured away from that. And so I think women are far more articulate emotionally and far clearer about what they're up to and what they want to build. And so I think women take the brunt of it. I think one of the tactical errors I see that women do is that they will create the entire relationship, right? They'll do their part, they'll do your part, they'll do the whole thing. <laughs> no? Yes? <laughs> and they're very good at it. So men feel like, yeah, I'm in a relationship. <laughs> they don't know what they're in, okay? So I think women overinvest, and that's why they're overexposed in a way. You know, find a guy who knows what you're up to. Gonna build. Yes? Can you have a relationship without an expectation? That's hard, isn't it? Because the minute it's good, you expect it to stay good. <laughs> Look, I think you have to have some forward thinking. Let's change expectations into planning or building, right? Let's, yeah, let's make it into something that doesn't create disappointment. Because I think that's kind of a toxic word, expectations. It's like attachments, right? You know, if you ask the Buddha, you should have a relationship without attachment. Good luck with that, by the way. <laughs> You see how that works. I'm not attached. Yeah, then you're not in a relationship. So I think, yeah, having no expectations and being detached in the following way, where you're not looking for another person to fill all of your emotional needs. I think if you're there, that's a huge advantage, right? Then you get to want somebody instead of needing them. We resent who we need. I think it does, and I think, you know, that's the journey. You know, I, I talk to people not in terms of their relationship, but in terms of their relationship life, right? Because it is a lifetime of learning, and each relationship is a piece of knowledge and information that you get. So it's your relationship life that's going to bring you to that place of wisdom. And ideally and hopefully it's with one person, but that wouldn't be my expectation. Good question, though. Do you, do you tell them your expectations? Who? Your significant other. If, if you should let your significant other know the expectations, is it fair to have expectations or plans without, I mean, they're doomed to fail if they don't know about it, right? I mean, that's setting it up for like... They're doomed to fail your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you have expectations in a relationship, then if, if they don't know about them, then... How about like this? The same thing, trust. Like, how about this? Instead of setting an agenda for your partner, why not set an agenda for you? Why not say, this is who I want to be, this is what I want to get, this is where I want to go, and invite that partner in to partner with you on that? Because I think the minute you say, you're going to do this, you're going to buy me flowers every Thursday, you're in a lot of trouble, because men have no memories. It's true. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah, I just mean... You don't like that. I'm just saying if you have expectations for the relationship, isn't it, wouldn't it be effective to let them know before you, like, have I, these expectations? 
What I would say is that if you have hopes and dreams and aspirations for that relationship, sure. But those land a little softer than expectations. Expectations land hard, okay? You know, if you think of what's been expected of you, you feel guilty right away, right? It feels like a burden. Pardon? You didn't meet that criteria. Right. But if you're invited in to, hey, this is what I want to do, this is what, this is what I want to create, this is how it, that's great. So there's a way of dreaming and inviting somebody into your dreams without making it an expectation. Does that make sense to you? Okay. <laughs> See, isn't pain a great teacher? I love that pain teaches. Yeah. Yeah. And being older, okay, and your expectations, your mindset is totally different. Is there a formula for accepting imperfections? As to, as a, and I'm setting it up with relationship versus marriage because I think when you're married, it's very easy to verbalize and say, honey, that shirt is really cutting, take it off. <laughs> Why is that easier? Um, Comfortable. Could, because you have a commitment? Because you're... Well, the relationship is a commitment. I mean, I think it is a level of commitment, sure. Yes, yes. And, and so where do you draw the line accepting the imperfections and should you verbalize them? Hmm. That's, <laughs> that's a tricky fish. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if the imperfections are things that you want to help him with and you do it in a kind and loving way, kind and loving way, not like, you're not going out like that, are you? That may not be that kind and loving, right? But I think, you know, we're all imperfect, you know? I mean, we seek perfection, we certainly try to polish the jewel that we are, but we all have imperfections, and that's okay. You know, that's, that's part of it. I was talking the other day about, oh wait, we got a little group going here. <laughs> You're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> Children. That if you put the Mona Lisa under a microscope, you're gonna see a mess. You're gonna see blobs of paint, real disaster, and you would think, who would want that, right? But if you back all the way up and see it in the right perspective, it is perfection. It's arguably the greatest masterpiece. So perfection, imperfection, it may be a point of view. It may be a matter of your perception or your perspective. And he should change that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. That's very good. And I thought that was very interesting. Well, the first part's easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And you don't want to be another because you don't want to take over the role, you know. Yeah. You don't want to take over the role. You know, Raise your man right, right? <laughs> but you do want to better that person. In some way. Yeah. Oh, I agree. I agree. But that sort of put him in that direction. Why would you want to do that? Isn't that controlling? Well, it depends. You know, if you see somebody's potential and you want to lovingly help bring them to that potential, that's great. But if you're whipping them to kind of meet that potential, that's not so great. It has to start out with acceptance and then transformation. But hear that again that any time you want to change somebody, and I do it all the time, by the way, it has to start with acceptance, right? Acceptance of somebody exactly the way they are, then you can change them. But it real, maybe not. But at least you're accepting. It's not so bad. Right. So what if they don't want to change? That's their right. And that may blow up the relationship. It might. Because I feel you could only do 
That's right. That's right. And that's well put. Yeah, you can only play your side of the court. You can't be over there running and hitting the ball back for them, which a lot of women do, by the way. And that's exhausting and thankless. Yeah. Yeah, play your side of the court. That's all you can do. And you have to know when sometimes, you know, set people with imperfections, but sometimes you have to know when to walk away. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you have to stay with everybody. Oh, I agree. I mean, you have, there is a time you have to, because you are thinking of yourself, you have to love yourself first before you love another person. You have to feel if something's best for you, and it doesn't mean you have to stay there and be so. Yes, you have to be supportive if you love them, but you have to look for the, the red flags, and if they're blinding, you have to say, you know, maybe it's time to walk away or move on or something. I agree. I think relationships are finite. I think it's, you know, it's a lovely notion that it should last forever and, you know, till death do us part. Um, but it is a finite situation. And there are times to absolutely walk away. There are times to run away, okay? Like, this is not working. When you're not loved or respected or honored or taken care of or seen or understood, you shouldn't be there. Unless that can happen, unless the potential for those things happening is there, you shouldn't be there. And I think that is self-love, right? An awareness that I need more than this, I deserve more than this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, till death do us part is scary. I mean, someone's dead and someone's alone. Question. Yes. Yes. How many men get this education? And your travels, how many men come to you? Like, like, because it's got to work both ways. Everybody needs the education, so it's bigger. Do the women have to educate the men, or do, you, do men come to your talks? And how many men get this education? Seven. <laughs> no. I think. You know, I was gratified. I did a, a focus group yesterday. Some of the people were clients and some of the people were, were I hadn't met. And again, what was intriguing was that the men love this. They love this information. I think they don't get exposed to this information. They don't hear it in a way that they can digest it. And they're usually on the guilt end of what I didn't do. And so they're on the defensive. But I think, given the opportunity, men would thrive with this information because there's a logic, there's an order, there's, a, there's a, an elegance to it that this will work. You know, if you do this work this way, it's going to work. You're going to have the relationship you want. And really, that's what men want. Do they avail themselves as much as women? No. And I'd like to see more. But I think it's starting. I think there's a consciousness that is starting. Yeah, another man. Hey. Speaking about imperfections, I would make the observation for what I dare say is a successful relationship with my wife sitting over there of 36 years is that I, I think when it comes to imperfections, there's the issue of love and trust. When my wife says, you're not going out of those pants, go up and change the pants. It's not, I have to accept the fact that she's doing it out of love and trust her that she's trying to make me a better person. Now, very frankly, I have no problem going out of the house looking like an unmade bed. <laughs> but I also have to trust her that she's not doing this, you know, because she's trying to drive me crazy. Right. She's trying to do this you know, to make me look better and be a better person in the process. It's a stretch sometimes to remind myself of that, but I think that's the essence of a good relationship. I have to trust her in these situations. Do you do the same thing to your wife when she gets ready to go She always looks perfect. Oh. <laughs> oh. And that's the right answer. <laughs> that's very good. <laughs> but I think you're right. I think it is your work to trust where someone's coming from. Yes. Your work to interpret what they're doing as, this is gonna improve me, this is gonna make me look better, this is gonna help me in the world. And I think you're right, that is a sign of a good relationship. That means there's a partnership here that has a basis of trust, that those, it can take those things, right? I love that, I think that's great. And that's mature love. 
You know, not this flashy romance or this, you know, oxytocin-based lust or this, you know, craziness or drama. You know, people are so in love with drama in relationship. And it's, it's the problem. You know, I think it's people that need a passion in life instead of making their relationship their passion. You know, they busy up with this drama, which just creates difficulty and disconnection. And it's misdirected energy. A good relationship should not have drama, right? Once in a while, you're going to... The ideal. The ideal. Well, they all do from time to time. Yeah. But you've got to navigate away from it. You know, you want a good, solid partnership where there's real communication. Trust, love, belief, right? Okay. Last question, anybody? How did you get into this whole career? How did I get into this career? <laughs> what interested you? Uh, when, I was, when I started as a psychotherapist, I went into a family counseling center and was thrown in the deep end. Here, now you're a family counselor. Now deal with these people. But I was fascinated by the miscommunication. You know, what struck me was that so many relationships are really essentially good, but there's no communication. And it was heartbreaking to watch people just missing each other, you know, saying things that nobody heard and, and not connecting. And I just got more and more intrigued by what are the, what are the obstacles to showing each other what's really there? You know, and I think I just made a study of it. I just got fascinated by it, you know, because, you know, believe it or not, most relationships that sit across from me that think they're doomed, it takes work, but I put them back together because there's a basis of love there. You know, you're not there for nothing. You're there because somewhere there is love there. Somewhere there's great potential there. And if you can kind of straighten out the lines of communication, all of that starts to flow. And so, so many relationships that you think can't possibly be rescued get resuscitated, rejuvenated, and even enlivened. So, it's kind of fun for me. It's almost a challenge in a way. You know, I see couples and it's like they're hanging on by a thread and my revenge is, I'm going to make this work, right? Yeah, and I'm good at it. I like doing it. I'm a good communicator and translator for people. <coughs> it's fun stuff. I'm in uh, Chelsea in Manhattan, 27th and 7th. Yeah, I do uh, group and individual counseling and couples therapy. It's a lot of fun. It's been a journey, you know. And frankly, I learn more than I teach, as you can imagine. Yeah. Fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you implying? <laughs> Bunch of weirdos? <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> Alright, so listen, thank you for being here. This, this has been great. Um, books and cards over there. Thanks very much. Oh. Thank you. Um, this has been terrific, and thank you all for the great questions and being so interactive. Um, we're now going to do the raffle. Ooh. And I didn't get Anne, do you want to? This is the first one is for the best buy. <sighs> Let me look wise. I wonder if those two are a couple. Sure. What's your name? Well, my name's Lauren, but it's, my sister is Julie. Julie? It's J U L I E. Okay. Okay. And um, she is engaged to be married. I don't know. If That's Lauren, great. Yes. <laughs> That's exciting. Yeah. We'll give her a little love and light. How about that? Did you enjoy the talk? I did.
good. good. It was great. Thank you. Couldn't tell by your face. Oh no, I was about to sneeze. Like, oh. <laughs> okay. I had too much coffee this morning. <laughs> so but, did I. Yes. But no, I did enjoy it. Oh good. I did, yes. Good. Yeah. Good seeing you. You too. Thank you. All right. Yeah, it's cheese ball, let me tell you. Commercialism. Crass commercialism. We should have. Um, oh. Should have. I forgot. I should have said for people to sign in if they want to be um, like get on a yeah. list and stuff. Yeah. Let's stand by the door and not let them out. Well, <laughs> Make them sign. <laughs> You're so pleased. I am changing the cover. No, the cover's nice. I'm just joking, but you know, but you know. you're not joking. <laughs> you should have heard the focus group. <laughs> they were all over it. But a little constructive criticism, you know. Cold? It's cold in here. Huh? Got to be up there more. Then you won't be cold. Look, act like you're getting a book signed. You can get your picture. You know, I wanted to say, like, I love you, I love you, I love you. You're the reason why I wrote this book. <laughs> yeah, really. I dedicate my life to you from now on forever. <laughs> and could you sign that in blood, please? <laughs> could... You're the inspiration. Crass commercialism. That's all. I learned a That's lot. It. I learned everything. A lot. I don't know. We're gonna do it better next time. It's good. Yes, we it's will. Good this time. It's gonna be even what better next time. Again? This is a Fisher Price, my first book signing. <laughs> Fisher Price. <laughs> Actually, I thought totally. it was really good. It was Who's all right? I thought, we, you know. I thought it was really. You guys were great. I thought you were fantastic. No, you. No. I really was good. I really think it was good. I just am going to be more on the ball. It was good once we got into the issues. Yes. Yes. I don't know about that softball of a visualization. I don't know. We have to have a different intro to it. Maybe that comes later. Maybe that comes It's a little too kumbaya. Oh. Not it's sure okay. about it. Not sure about it. Maybe it's an effective okay. way to end. Yeah, so. yeah, put them to sleep. Shake everybody's hand and loosen up in the beginning. No, no, no. There has, it has to be a better. If we have to. They were laughing what the though. Intro is. Some of those women are hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm in the beginning. Everybody no, didn't you think they were funny? We need to yeah. set what we need to talk about first intro. We were and just talking next about time. About the women? Yeah. 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 We already discussed that in the That's car. What I'm she didn't do it. She said yeah. that there's many yeah. other women. Yeah. Like, like, like I saw. Like, like, I know. You know what I'm saying? Like, they tried to what? That won't answer yeah, the question? Oh, oh. Oh, yeah. And if, 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 if depending on the personality of the person asking the question, it's like for me, I'm like, eh, there are seminars, but like if it's someone, it will be amazing. Please, there's a sign up for the sign up. So we were talking about like the power dynamics. Also, why are you the grab? Well, I'll let them go for a little bit, but. You know, then give that back to me. I'm going to take it where I think I can use it. But yeah, they're they're pretty funny. Some of them are pretty muscling up there. That crew over there. How do you set it up presentation-wise? How does it look good? Yeah, really. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but... Right. Okay. Not for you. Thomas, are you still Good like seeing you. Can you sign three more? Sure. Thank you. Two. I'm going to need some names. <laughs> Carol? Yeah. Carol? I have friends that need help. 
Uh huh. Okay. Tanya? Okay. Bonnie. Bonnie? Bonnie? I.E. They're a good friend to get them these. <laughs> I have lots of questions, like, would I be able to contact you? Or oh, I sure. Don't want to spend too much, but I mean, I'm married for 10 years almost, July. But, like, how do you, like, bring the romance? And when it, you know, I have a, we have a you know, I, seven, and it's like. There are absolutely ways yeah. to do that. <laughs> no, you can. There's so many questions I have, but. Yeah. Give me a call. Okay, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It was good seeing you. You too. Thank you very Take much. Care. Bye bye. Shall we? Surely? Hey. Crass capitalism. I'm out of here, man. I can't take this. Thank you. Thank you. It was lots of fun. It was